All right, so um, welcome uh, everybody. I just thought I'd start with the introduction for Sue Sharma. So Sue has been a PhD student and she's a PhD student in BCS and she has been my student since 2018, which is just the year that I came here to MIT. And so she was one of the first um, lab members that I was uh, very glad to have uh, in the lab. And over time, you know, here, Sue came to me kind of with a, with a uh, strong training in engineering and also uh, a strong cognitive interest and focus in cognitive science. And, uh, but, you know, in her characteristic way, she has been able and willing to learn all kinds of things, including humoring my pull of her into systems neuroscience. And so, um, you know, as you'll see, I think she's made uh, a bunch of multifaceted contributions to understanding um, the problems of uh, memory and spatial navigation and how they're implemented in the hippocampus, uh, thinking about them from a computational lens, thinking about memory from a, um, a capacity lens, and also thinking about it from the perspective of more um, sort of probabilistic inference uh, perspective. So, you know, she kind of brings together a lot of different pieces. She's thought about um, human cognition, done human experiments. Uh, she's done, you know, a bunch of deep learning as well as um, designing multi-region systems models of how these circuits can perform. Um, on a more personal note, Sue has been, you know, a really, um, a, a very active and very, um, you know, uh, core member of the group. She's been, you know, involved in uh, mentoring undergraduates. She's been uh, representing our lab in, in various different uh, roles, including for outreach and diversity, inclusion, equity um, uh, uh, groups. And she's also, you know, been our computing representative. She's provided mentorship to lots of new lab members um, in general, and she's just overall being a wonderful presence and a very, you know, very, um, very uh, um, sort of fun person to have in lab. So it's kind of always bittersweet as an advisor to introduce a PhD student who's defending their thesis. It's great um, to see all that she's achieved. And of course we will, you know, be missing her in the lab when she has left. But um, I look forward to letting her tell you about what she's done. So um, take it away, Sue. Wow. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Ida. Um, I'll try my best to do justice to it through my talk today. And thanks everyone uh, for joining, uh, both to the people who are here in the room and also to the people who are joining us on Zoom. So today I'm gonna to be talking about spatial mapping, memory, the relationship between the two and their underlying mechanisms in the hippocampal corpus. So humans form mental representations of the spaces and environments around them. And this is fundamental to tasks such as navigation, spatial reasoning, understanding the relationships between objects uh, in our environment. For instance, we know where our workplaces are relative to where we live. And there are various cognitive processes that are involved in spatial mapping, which include perception, memory, and spatial reasoning. And memory forms a very important aspect of spatial mapping because as individuals travel and explore spatial environments, they are encoding and storing information about the spatial layouts and recalling them to further navigate and perform tasks in these environments. There's also evidence that humans convert the continuous stream of experience into meaningful segments. Research has shown that when adults watch videos of a woman assembling a tent, they often segment it into these six major segments that are meaningful. For instance, putting down the tent, spreading it out, inserting the front end pole, staking out the ends of the tent, the sides of the tent, and attaching a rain fly. So these event segments are a natural way to create hierarchical representations. And it's possible that as humans experience spaces, they might also be segmenting spaces into meaningful segments that might be useful for creating hierarchical representations. In fact, there is a lot of evidence that humans form hierarchical representations of space. People represent the geography of the world hierarchically, for instance, when people are asked where Reno is relative to Los Angeles, they often say that Reno is to the east of Los Angeles because they know that Nevada is to the east of California. But actually, Reno is to the west of Los Angeles. So this indicates hierarchical representations of space. Further, people also represent spaces with boundaries hierarchically. For instance, they underestimate the distances between objects in the same quadrants and overestimate the distances between objects that are separated by either transparent or opaque barriers. Further, people also represent spaces with unclear boundaries hierarchically. And there's also evidence that humans construct approximate spatial representations, sacrificing the global metric accuracy. 
And these concepts have been used in robotics to build robots that are tasked with mapping large spaces. So these robots, robots instead of mapping uh, and learning a global map of these spaces, end up learning local maps, which are connected through transformations. So one of the open questions in the field that we wish to address then is how can these local representations or submaps be recombined and reused to form hierarchical spatial representations that generalize to representing novel spaces? Another salient aspect of human spatial mapping is that humans learn a lot of spatial maps during their lifetimes. We learn maps of our residential neighborhoods, of the apartment buildings we live in, of our workplaces, of our favorite shopping malls, and even different parts of the cities that we visit. So the question is, how do humans store the vast amount of spatial information experienced through their lifetimes? There is a class of models called content addressable memory models that are compelling models of long-term memory, similar to how humans can recognize situations and items seen before, and they're able to fill in the details from partial observations. Similarly, given a noisy or partial version of a previously learned memory, content addressable memory models are able to reconstruct this memory through their internal dynamics. However, existing content addressable memory models exhibit a memory cliff. For instance, in a Hopfield network with n neurons and n square synapses, storing up to n patterns leads to perfect recall, but storing patterns beyond n leads to a catastrophic drop. So this network can not only, not only does this network fail to store any further memories, but it also forgets all the previous memories that were stored in this network. And this is unlike human memory, because humans show gradual degradation of information as they accumulate more memories over time. And so ideally, we want to build a network that shows a continuum between storage of few high detail memories and storage of many low detail memories with gradual degradation of information per memory as we store more memories into the network. However, this is not how existing content addressable memory models operate. Most of them just form points on this continuum rather than spanning this whole con continuum. For instance, a Hopfield model just forms a point. Various versions and variants of the Hopfield networks, which have constrained activations or sparse inputs, as well as the modern Hopfield networks just form points on this continuum. And in fact, even a tail biting autoencoder that's considered to act as a content addressable memory model also shows catastrophic loss and fails to span the entire continuum. So another question that we wish to address then is, can we build a content addressable memory model with a smooth trade-off between the number of memories and the richness of those memories, such that the model spans this entire continuum between storage of few high detail memories to storage of many low detail memories? Now, so far, both questions that we've posed uh, have been at the computational and uh, algorithmic levels about spatial mapping and memory. And next, we want to understand how these uh, both, both of these functions might be implemented at the implementation level in the brain. So it turns out that there's this part of the brain called hippocampus that's implicated in both spatial mapping and also episodic memory. Uh, there are cells called place cells that have been found in hippocampus that code for certain locations in a 2D room. And from uh, the afflictions of patient HM, it has long been known that hippocampus has a strong role to play in episodic memory. The, the hippocampus of this patient was damaged and after that they weren't able to form new memories. And so the question is why is the same brain area tasked with these two seemingly independent roles? Now, there are many existing models of hippocampal complex that explain many aspects of hippocampal phenomenology and have greatly advanced our understanding of the system but they do have their limitations, and I'll just point out some of them. Some of these models are models at computational and algorithmic levels, so they do not have direct biological implementations or anatomical mappings, because of which it becomes difficult to make experimentally testable predictions from these models. Another class of models models the internal dynamics of the hippocampal complex and the interactions between different components of the hippocampal complex, but it only stores internal states and fails to store any external inputs. Thirdly, the class of models that does store external inputs lacks high capacity memory. 
So another open question that we would like to address is, can we build a mechanistic model of the hippocampal complex that unifies the spatial and episodic memory rules of hippocampal while still maintaining high capacity? So the rest of the talk is divided into these three sections. First, I'll talk about map induction. Then I'll talk about mesh. And then I'll talk about vector hash. And these are three models that attempt to address the three questions that we've identified so far. So given that we know that humans are forming approximate spatial representations that are local, and that they do have hierarchical representations, we ask how can this the submaps of the local representations be recombined and reused to form hierarchical spatial representations that generalize to representing novel spaces? To answer this question, we take a fun functional example of human exploration and foraging. Humans are expert explorers and foragers. We can go to a completely new country for a conference, and we are able to find our way in a new city and a new conference venue. So the question is, what computations underlie this cognitive ability? To answer this question, we propose a map induction hypothesis, which suggests that as humans explore novel environments, they're inducing maps of unobserved parts of the environment based on parts of the environment that they've observed and also based on their prior experiences in familiar environments that are similar to the current environment. For instance, in a berry foraging task, one might anticipate that the landscape of hills will continue in the same fashion and that the distribution of berries in unobserved spaces would be similar to that observed so far. And more formally, we can think of this as inferring the programs that could have generated an environment given past observations. So to test the map induction hypothesis, we conduct human behavioral experiments in structured environments with rewards embedded into them. We allow the subjects to navigate these environments from a first person perspective. These subjects do not have access to a top down map of the environment. And the task given to them is to find the rewards embedded in the environment in a constrained amount of time given to them per trial. To formalize the map induction hypothesis, we build map induction based generative models that induce maps through composition of map fragments. These models have four core components that I'll explain using this toy example. First is the region extractor that extracts region primitives from observed parts of the environment uh, to form these submaps or region primitives. The map generator then uses these submaps and composes them to form map hypotheses based on an underlying probabilistic generative grammar that has transformations like reflections, rotations, and scalings. And this is because humans do have uh, you know, invariant representations. And for instance, when we are tra traversing in a hotel, the left wing of a hotel uh, is symmetric to the right wing, and they are just mirror images of each other. So having seen the left wing, we can almost predict what the right wing would look like. So that's the gist of the underlying transformations in, uh, encoded in the probabilistic grammar. And that's what the map generator uses to compose these map primitives to form map hypotheses. The map inference that infers a probability distribution over these hypotheses, which are used by the planner to plan the next steps in the environment in a model-based reinforcement learning setup. So we model this exploration problem as a partially observed mark of decision process where the state is not directly observable by the agent, but is only inferred through a sequence of observations. And POMDP is described as a standard tuple of states, actions, transition function, rewards, uh, observations in the environment, an observation function, and a discount factor. And the optimal agent acts to maximize the expected discounted reward in a given environment. And since we cannot exactly solve a POMDP, we resort to approximate sampling methods like Monte Carlo sampling in order to approximate the solution of the POMCP using the POMCP planner. So we consider three model hypotheses, a uniform model that assumes a uniform distribution over the existence of empty space reward or a wall in unobserved parts of the spaces. This model doesn't use map induction, so it has no spatial priors. And you can think of it as using an unconstrained distribution of maps to plan the next steps in the environment. Then we have a maximum a posteriori model or map POMCP model that uses the most likely map out of the hypothesized distribution of maps to plan the next steps in the environment. And lastly, we, we hypothesize the distributional model that uses all the hypothesized maps generated by the map generator in order to plan the next steps in the environment. 
And importantly, this distribution can be thought of as a constrained distribution relative to the unconstrained distribution used by the uniform model. Here's an example of the uniform model exploring a space. You can see that the uniform model ends up exploring the space exhaustively because it doesn't have any spatial priors and hence it doesn't have any expectation of where it's more likely to find rewards. In contrast, the map induction-based models induce the maps of the environment in an online way, updating their estimate of the map based on new observations. And since they have a hypothesized map, they have expectation of where they are more likely to find the rewards. And hence that leads to more efficient exploration relative to exhaustive exploration. Here's another example of a map induction-based model, which finds rewards in this partially observed environment. So through experiments, we find that map induction is critical for human-like optimal exploration. In panel A, I'm showing the trajectories of a representative subject from three environments used in the experiment. And panel B shows averaged heat maps of all the subjects averaged. So the results show that as expected, the uniform form CP model explores these environments exhaustively. Whereas the map induction based models explored the environments selectively, similar to what humans do. And if we look at the log likelihood of these models conditioned on human behavioral data, we find that both map induction based models are more likely than the baseline uniform form CP models. However, this experiment can't be used to distinguish between both map induction based models. Through a subsequent experiment, we find that humans build a distribution of possible maps through map induction. So here we have rewards embedded in environments that are guided by color cues. And we find that the amount of environment observed in this case by humans is closer to the distributional form CP model. And the log likelihood of the distributional form CP model conditioned on human behavioral data is much higher than that of the map model. So to summarize, research suggests that humans build a constrained distribution of possible maps through an inductive process by composing map fragments to represent novel parts of the environment. Map induction is a conceptually new way to think about navigation in few and zero shot settings. And map induction significantly improves the exploration performance of the state of the art partially observed Monte Carlo planning. Now that we've seen how submaps can be recombined and reused to form hierarchical representations that are useful for map induction, and that leads to efficient exploration, we ask how humans are able to store the vast amount of spatial information that they experience through their lifetimes. More specifically, we ask, can we build a content addressable memory with a smooth trade-off between the number of memories and their richness? As we saw before, we know that human-like memory should exhibit a continuum. So given an upper bound on the amount of information that can be stored in any network, which is given by the total number of synapses in the network as shown by previous theoretical work, we want to build an architecture which leads to complete recovery of small number of memory states up to re partial recovery of many number of memory states with gradual degradation of information per pattern as we store more patterns into this network. So memories should only be gradually forgotten and key is to recover all the stored memory states, although with lower information or accuracy per memory. And as we saw before, existing content addressable memory models lack a memory continuum. They show a memory cliff and only form points on this memory continuum. And what we want is an architecture that can show a smooth trade-off between the number of patterns and the richness of those patterns spanning this entire continuum. And that's a model that I'll present, which is able to accomplish this continuum. So the model is called MESH, or Memory Scaffold with Hetero Association. It's a three-layer recurrently connected network with some weights that are fixed and some weights that are learned through one-shot unsupervised Hebbian learning type learning routes. And so the key behind MESH is that it factorizes the memory or the fixed points from the content that needs to be stored in the network. So the first two layers of this network implement a memory scaffold, which you can think of as an underlying attractor manifold with predefined fixed point states embedded into it. The total number of states that can be embedded on the memory scaffold is given by NL choose K, 
where NL is the dimensionality of the label layer states that are k-hot. And this scales exponentially in the number of label neurons. Now, if we want to store content in this network, uh, we can represent arbitrary patterns through the feature layer that is associated to the scaffold through heteroassociation. For instance, if I wanted to remember my dad's favorite shirt, I would just take that memory and tag it onto one of the predefined fixed points. If I wanted to remember someone I met at a conference, I would take that memory and tag it onto another uh, fixed point on the scaffold and so on and so forth. Now that we've stored content into mesh, we test mesh similar to any content addressable memory model where given a noisy or partial input, we want to see whether mesh is able to reconstruct these stored memories. We find that mesh exhibits a near optimal CAM continuum. For patterns up to the uh, dimensionality of the hidden layer, mesh is able to reconstruct complete information for all of those patterns. However, as we store patterns greater than NH, it leads to gradual degradation of information per memory. So again, it leads to complete recovery of all information up to NH memories, partial recovery of each of the memories beyond NH, with gradual degradation of information per memory as we continue to store more memories into this net network up to the upper bound of NL choose scale. When we compare this network with existing networks, we find that in existing, existing networks, as we increase the information stored per synapse, the information recovered per synapse goes down to zero. Whereas in mesh, given a network of fixed size, the total information is invariant to the number of stored patterns. And this indicates a smooth trade-off between the number of patterns that can be stored in mesh and the richness of those patterns. We also find that in addition to discrete patterns, mesh can also store continuous value patterns with the same gradual degradation. And in fact, mesh can also be seen as an autoencoder with constrained activations and one-shot learn weights. And when we compare it to a tail-biting autoencoder that also acts as a content addressable memory, we find that mesh shows gradual degradation of information per pattern and can store many more patterns relative to, to an autoencoder which shows this catastrophic drop. And we can also see the same thing numerically. So now that we've seen what mesh can accomplish, uh, we will see how mesh actually works. So first we look at the memory scaffold. Memory scaffold stores pre-structured states with no information. And because these states are pre-structured, that's why they don't have any information. And this scaffold is implemented by a two-layer recurrently connected neural network, where the label states represent binary 01 states that are k-hot and nl-dimensional. The weights from the label layers to the hidden layers are random. Back project The hidden layers are defined as random projections of the label layer. And back projections from the hidden layer to the label layer are learned through one-shot associative Hebbian learning. We find that the memory scaffold stores all states as fixed points. Given a critical number of neurons in the hidden layer, memory scaffold is able to stabilize all states on the scaffold up to NL choose K points as fixed points of its dynamics. And more importantly, asymptotically with large NL, this critical number of hidden neurons becomes independent of NL and only scales linearly with K. Further, we also find that memory scaffold has an exponential capacity in the number of label neurons. Assuming a constant density K by NL of stored labels, as we increase the number of label neurons, the number of successfully recovered patterns increases exponentially. So that, now that we've seen how we can build a memory scaffold, which has an exponential capacity, we are ready to store actual content-laden patterns into this network. So we can store arbitrary patterns into this network by representing them through the feature layer, which is associated with the scaffold through online pseudo-inverse learning, which approximates the offline pseudo-inverse matrices. Now, given a noisy version of a previously stored memory, this network computes a noisy hidden state, which is then used to compute a noisy label state that can be cleaned up through the top K winner take all dynamics on the label layer. And this cleaned up label state is then used to reconstruct the cleaned up hidden state, which finally reconstructs the stored memory. We find that in this network, going from features to labels is a perfect map. Labels are recovered perfectly for storage of exponentially many patterns up to the total of NL choose K patterns. 
However, recovery of features from labels is what leads to a continuum. So only up to NH arbitrary patterns can be recalled from labels, as shown by the green curve in this uh, plot. And beyond NH, this model leads to a continuum of recovered patterns, such that the information per pattern degrades smoothly as we store more patterns into the network. And although these patterns are partially recovered, we find that the partially recovered patterns still continue to lie near the true patterns. So if we examine the feature space, we find that the recovered patterns lie on top of the true patterns for up to the storage of NH patterns. Beyond NH, we have a gradual departure of recovered patterns from true patterns. However, these patterns still continue to lie within the correct word noise cells. Now, why is the feature layer to label layer a perfect map? In order to understand this, we uh, see that we make an observation that going from features to labels is a computation that is similar to projecting this n paths dimensional vector, where n paths is the number of memories stored in the network, onto an NF dimensional plane. And since the number of patterns that we can store in this network is always less than NF, we always recover complete information. However, when going from labels to features, that's not a perfect map and that's what leads to a continuum. And this happens because this computation is now analogous to projecting this n paths dimensional vector onto an NH dimensional plane. And since the number of, as long as the number of patterns is less than NH, we recover complete information. However, as we increase the number of patterns beyond NH, we start to lose information in those extra dimensions. And that's what leads to partial recovery leading to a continuum. So to summarize, MESH is a biologically plausible associative memory model without a catastrophic memory cliff. It generates an exponentially large number of fixed points in the memory scaffold, and the hetero association then tags arbitrary patterns to these fixed points. We find that mesh leads to a smooth trade-off between the number of memories that can be stored in the network and the richness of those memories. So now that we've seen how we can build a high capacity memory model that has a smooth trade-off in the number of memories that can be stored in it and the richness of those memories, we ask how can both the functions of spatial map mapping and memory be implemented at the implementation level in the brain? And more specifically ask, can we build a mechanistic model of the hippocampal complex that unifies spatial and episodic memory and has high capacity? So as we saw before, hippocampus is this area that has both of these important roles of spatial mapping and episodic memory. And the question is, why is the same brain area tasked with these two seemingly independent roles? So hippocampus also interacts with entorhinal cortex, which is a region of the brain that lies close to hippocampus. And place cells have been found in the hippocampus, which fire at certain locations in 2D space, whereas grid cells have been found in the entorhinal cortex, which fire at multiple locations in a 2D space, forming a grid-like pattern. And so in order to model the interactions between the hippocampus and the entorhinal cortex, we extend mesh to build a grid hippocampal model. We take the random k hot code and the top k winner take all dynamics on the label layer and replace it with the modular one hot grid code and modular attracted dynamics of grid modules. So we replace this k hot code with one hot code that's modular and periodic and represents a state on a ring. And we further generalize this to 2D code, which represents a state on a torus. And this leads us to a model called vector hash or vector hippocampal scaffold memory with hetero association. This model has three main components, grid cells with their modular attracted dynamics, hippocampal cells with their continuous sparse activations, and non-grid entorhinal cells that represent external sensory observations. And the key is that the grid cells together with hippocampus form this rigid structured invariant scaffold with fixed weights, and content can be stored in this network by representing arbitrary patterns in the non-grid entorhinal cortex that can be associated with the scaffold through heteroassociation. And you can think of this model as analogous to a hippocampal clothes line, where hippocampus together with the grid cells forms this structured invariant scaffold onto which external cues can be hooked, much in the same way as clothes can be hooked onto a clothes line. 
So mesh and uh, vector hash inherits all properties of mesh. Uh, and in addition, it shows this strong generalization property in the scaffold, where to train the scaffold, the, the scaffold needs to be trained on only a small vanishing fraction of the grid coding state for it to stabilize all the grid coding states as fixed points. Thus, it generalizes to states that it hasn't even seen before. And we can think of the scaffold weights as weights that can be learned once through early spatial exploration and then held fixed for life. The same core architecture in vector hash enables all three forms of memory, retrieval of random items, retrieval of spatial information like landmarks and position, and retrieval of sequential episodic memories. So we first look at item memory and we examine the scaffold dynamics. So the grid cells project to the hippocampal layer through random projections and back projections from hippocampus to the grid cells are learned through one shot Hebbian learning, which couples the co-active grid cells in different grid modules. Now, given a noisy hippocampal state, that is a noisy version of an, a hippocampal state that was previously stored in this network, through projection to the grid layer and through its winner-take-all dynamics, uh, modular attracted dynamics in the recurrent connections of grid layer, the network can actually recover the hippocampal state, which matches the original hippocampal state, establishing that the scaffold is a robust attractor. Further, because of the exponential capacity of grid cells, this network inherits exponentially many fixed points. And more importantly, the number of hippocampal cells needed to support these exponentially many fixed points only grows linearly with the number of grid modules, establishing the truly exponential capacity of the scaffold. Further, we find that the scaffold forms large uniform bases around its fixed points. So given the magnitude of the perturbation, which is four times the magnitude of the hippocampal state, we can still recover the hippocampal state at least half of the times. So this establishes that the entorhinal hippocampal network creates a high capacity robust scaffold with an exponentially large number of fixed points. Now, once we have the scaffold, we can store arbitrary information into this network by simply linking arbitrary sensory inputs to the scaffold. And given any stored sensory inputs in the network, we can reconstruct these sensory inputs using internal network dynamics. We find that for patterns up to the order of the number of hippocampal cells, vector hash acts as a perfect associative memory. With increasingly large number of stored items, pattern recall is degraded, but it only degrades very smoothly. This establishes that the scaffold can be associated with arbitrary inputs to generate a flexible high capacity memory continuum similar to mesh. And similar to mesh, vector hash also has information where total information is invariant to the number of stored patterns. Next, we look at spatial memory. The same core architecture in vector hash can enable spatial memory by just adding velocity inputs to the grid code. Given an agent that explores a spatial environment, the velocity inputs update the grid code that represent locations in the space, and sensory landmark inputs can be associated with these grid codes. And thus, this leads to bidirectional inference in familiar environments. Given a seen landmark, the network is able to reconstruct uh, the, grid, the corresponding grid state that represents the corresponding position where the landmark was seen. And similarly, given a known position represented by a given grid state, the network is able to reconstruct the landmark that was seen at that position. This architecture also leads to zero-shot inference in novel environments. Given an agent that observes landmarks during an initial exploratory trajectory in a novel environment, the network leads to zero-shot prediction of landmarks on a novel trajectory. Next, we look at episodic memory. Here, instead of learning sequences by learning high-dimensional transitions in this high-dimensional space, vector hash maps the problem of learning these high-dimensional transitions to simply learning low-dimensional transitions on a sequence scaffold. And high dimensional sensory inputs can then simply be associated with the scaffold. Let's look at how this can be implemented in vector hash. So, we use the same core architecture in vector hash and learn a, a multi layer perceptron, where the multi layer perceptron learns the next action predictions in an abstract sequence on the grid coding space. This network through low dimensional velocity updates is able to store very long sequences 
which is in contrast with existing baseline hop field models, which have a catastrophic draw because they are trying to learn transitions in this high dimensional space and they fail even when they're aided with the scaffold. We find that the same architecture is able to store sequence scaffolds of arbitrary shapes. It has a high capacity. And more importantly, the high capacity in is enabled by a very few number of cells in the scaffold. You can see the difference between the scale on the x-axis, which indicates the number of cells, and on the y-axis, which indicate the length of these sequences. And so this is made possible only because this network is learning low dimensional transitions rather than learning high dimensional transitions. Once we have the scaffold, we can now store information into this uh, by simply associating sensory inputs with different parts of the scaffold. And this leads to the same optimal memory continuum leading to storage of exponentially long sequences. And here this network architecture has hippocampus driven transitions but the same optimal memory continuum can also be achieved by an alternative architecture that has sensory driven transitions. And this is in contrast with existing networks that try to learn sequences by learning transitions in a high dimensional space and hence show a catastrophic drop. So qualitatively, both sequence memory architectures with grid cells are enabled by velocity updates to grid codes that are low dimensional. And this enables us to map a problem of learning transitions in this high dimensional space to simply learning transitions on a low dimensional sequence scaffold that turns out to be highly effective in memorizing sequences. We also find that vector hash provides a neural model for memory palaces. Memory palace is a mnemonic technique where memory athletes try to remember this long list of items, for instance, a deck of cards. And they imagine themselves as walking through a familiar spatial environment, for instance, their home. And as they walk through this familiar spatial environment, they take these new list of items that they want to remember and place them on different landmarks through this path. So in vector hash, we add a mnemonic input that represents these new items. The path through the environment is encoded in the sequence scaffold, which gets associated with sensory landmark inputs represented by the sensory layer. And the new items are then associated with these landmark, landmark inputs uh, through pseudo-inverse learning. We find that in this model, even though the recall of the sensory items degrades with the increase in the length of items that need to be remembered, the recall of the list of items itself is perfect. And this can also be seen numerically. So now that we've seen everything that vector hash can accomplish, we look at the multiple aspects of hippocampal phenomenology that also emerge in vector hash. So first we look at high capacity spatial memory. So this is an experiment where 11 different rooms were found to have 11 different place cell maps that were orthogonal to each other, establishing the high capacity of the system. And so we train vector hash under a protocol where we sequentially train it on these 11 rooms. And we look at the stability of the place cell maps during training after all the maps have been learned and also in the absence of sensory cues. We find that these place cell maps are highly stable across these rooms and they do not have interference. The representations learned across these rooms are orthogonal as found in experiments. And this happens because vector hash allocates different parts of the grid coding space to represent these rooms, which leads to decorrelated underlying grid codes leading to orthogonal place cell representations. Now, although this experiment didn't look at grid codes, we can uh, examine grid cell firing fields in vector hash since this is a mechanistic model. And so we find that uh, the, the grid cell maps across rooms are shifted versions of each other, but this do preserve cell-cell correlations. There's a wide range of other hippocampal phenomenology that also emerges in vector hash, including splitter cells, root-dependent cells, directional cells, and task-dependent cells. Further, we find that observations of memory consolidation also emerge in vector hash. So given a sensory input that is repeatedly seen or recalled, the corresponding weights in vector hash get strengthened, and that leads to these repeated patterns being robust to lesions of the hippocampus relative to unrepeated patterns, which haven't been reinforced. And this can also be seen numerically in the sensory recovery error of repeated patterns, which, which is much lower than that of unrepeated patterns. And this turns out to be consistent with the multiple trace theory of hippocampus. <laughs>
So to summarize, vector hash is the first hippocampal entorhinal model that unifies high capacity item memory, spatial memory, and episodic memory. Vector hash uses the same representational structure used in spatial mapping to generate this high capacity episodic memory. And multiple aspects of hippocampal phenomenology emerge in vector hash. So to sum it all up, in the first part, we saw how we could compose submaps to form hierarchical spatial representations for representing novel spaces or novel parts of unobserved environments. And this is useful for map induction, which leads to efficient exploration in novel spaces. Map induction is a conceptually new way to think about navigation in few and zero shot settings and improves the exploration performance of POMCP models in novel environments. Next, we asked how can humans store this vast amount of map primitives and spatial maps encountered through their lifetimes? And to address that question, we implemented a high capacity memory model called Mesh, which shows a smooth trade-off between the number of memories that can be stored in this network and the richness of those memories. More importantly, Mesh separates the memories that have, uh, or the fixed points that are used to store the memories from the content that actually needs to be stored with memory scaffold implementing an exponentially large number of fixed points to which external content can be tapped through heteroassociation. And further, we thought about how spatial mapping and memory could be implemented in the brain at the implementation level. And to answer that question, we extended mesh to model an entorhinal hippocampal circuit called vector hash. Vector hash inherits all memory properties of mesh with an additional property that the scaffold has strong generalization and can be trained much quickly. Further, vector hash uses the same representational structure used for spatial mapping to store episodic memories, which unifies the spatial memory, spatial mapping and episodic memory roles of hippocampus. And a range of hippocampal phenomenology also emerges in vector hash. So that's all.